welcome everybody. Thank you um, for the participants for tuning in on this, this Friday morning. Um, and welcome to this combined team effort really between Unichem and Kilgem Chemicals Limited. Unichem are uh, a manufacturer of insecticides and rodenticides, as we'll see. We'll hear about the two brands. We'll hear about the Ratimo brand, Rodenticide Wise, and we'll hear about the Effect brand in terms of insecticides. Uh, we're very glad to have Marco on hand uh, to deliver presentations on those, those topics. And to complement that, myself, Matthew Davis, and my colleague, Richard Noel, will also deliver some short presentations regarding products that complement those ranges. And um, so it should be a good set of presentations. There'll be a mix of technical content as well as some commercial content. So I think that tends to satisfy everybody and you get a bit of both and we'll hopefully learn some new things and enjoy ourselves. And um, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll get started, I think. I feel like I should make an announcement about fire exits and smoking areas and first aid. Mm -hmm. I can't get that out of my system being a face-to-face -face sort of trend, but we don't need to do that today. Maybe at home, check your nearest fire exit or make sure that you've had a cigarette already uh, or consult your nearest first aider. I think we should be uh, low risk today. Um, I will say as well that part of the agenda, we will have a, a little break, a 15-minute break for a, a tea and coffee. We're not providing those today. You've got to make your own, I'm afraid. So uh, that's uh, from your own from your own kitchen or the nearest vending machine. Uh, we'll do that. There's an opportunity for Q and A as well. So pop any questions you have in the Q and A session, and we'll answer those as a as a team at the allotted times. So the uh, sort of ten o'clock start time. We're probably looking to finish between eleven forty and twelve o'clock, depending on how long the the Q and A sessions uh, take us really. And um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, near the end, Richard has got some information on some, uh, some product offers that relate to the, the content of today. And I'll, I'll leave that to Richard because I've got my technical head on, which is uh, the right thing for me personally. And uh, yeah, I just hope everyone's sitting comf comfortably and has had a, a nice breakfast and has maybe got a good hot drink uh, to accompany them. So I think um, about time to get, to get started. I think um, what I'll do, Marco has a, a presentation that I will start in a moment's time. But I think to make things a bit more personal, if, uh, if Marco doesn't mind saying a very brief hello for a minute, I think that'll be nice. Say hello to the Kill Germ attendees. Sure, no problem. Hey, to everyone. Uh, so Matthew uh, mentioned, my name is Marco, uh, head in the, of uh, R&D for Biocide uh, at Unichem. Uh, today, uh, you will listen to, to my presentations uh, about uh, rodenticides and insecticides. Uh, hope you will like them, and uh, at the end, we will discuss some, let's say, open topics and questions, and so on. Thank you. Excellent. Sounds perfect. So, on that note, I will begin the first presentation. Hello, and welcome to everyone. My name is Marko Cvić, Head of Research and Development Department at Unichem. Today I will present you company Unichem and products for pest control under Ratimor and Effect brand. Company Unichem is located nearby the capital city of Slovenia and has the tradition of more than 30 years. Currently we have 100 employees in Slovenia and 50 employees in our daughter companies. Unichem produces products for plant nutrition and products for protection against insects and rodents. In our product portfolio is currently over 250 different products in over 800 different packagings. Unikim has also modern automated production and logistics center that takes care for the uninterrupted supply of the product to our customers around the world. Domestic market is Slovenia, which is treated as own business unit, where we, also, where we are also market leader. Then we have five subsidiary companies. These are Croatia, Hungary, Czech Republic, Slovakia and Poland. Our export currently comprise of 60 countries around the world. The company Unicam was established 30 years ago and has been growing steadily ever since as presented on this graph. With strong focus on R&D, Unicam has its own team of experts with global experiences from different fields and is connecting with different research laboratories around the Europe. Modern and automated technology take care of the production of various products with special focus to quality and long-term solutions. For a stable partnership, 
with our customers all around the world, Unicam has its own product registrations, allowing us independence and flexibility. In the following slides, I will present to you most important information about Ratimor rodenticides. Ratimor rodenticides are sold worldwide as presented with blue color on this map. Our regulatory team ensures that the sales department can market products under the Ratimor brand currently in over 55 countries all around the world, from European countries to Asia, United States of America, Latin America countries, Africa, Australia, and so on. Rodenticides under Ratimor brand are available with three different active ingredients. These are bromodialon, brodifacum, and difenacum, which are all second-generation anticoagulants. Baits are also available in different forms, such as fresh bait, wax blocks, pellets, and grain bait. There are also some special forms, like wax blocks with integrated wire with hook in the block, for easier application or positioning of the product in sewers. And there is also user-friendly packaging of fresh bait, packed in plastic trays, where user does not come in contact with the bait at any time, not at placing the bait and neither at cleaning the baiting points. In the UK, Unikim is present on the market with all four formulations as mentioned before. Fresh bait, wax blocks, pellets and grain bait. Products are available with different active ingredients and concentrations. Brodiafacum formulation with 29 ppm of active ingredient and bromodialon and difenacum with 50 ppm of active ingredient in the product. Also special forms of wax block with wire and fresh bait in plastic tray are available. And in order to reduce plastic waste, Unicam decided to pack rodenticide product in carton boxes and thus contributes to reducing the consumption of plastic materials. We will now closely look to our Ratimor Bodaifacum brand and to products that are part of it. Ratimor Bodaifacum products contain active ingredient Bordaifacum with concentration of 29 ppm. Active ingredient Bordaifacum is single feed second generation anticoagulant and is one of the most potent active ingredients. Due to its high potency, it has an excellent level of activity against rats and mice and compared to other anticoagulants, it currently does not have any known resistance. The great strength of Bordaifacum is presented in the table below. If you take a look at little doses for each active ingredient, we see that against mouse, Bordaifacum active ingredient is two times stronger than Difenacum and more than four times stronger than Bromodialon. And against rats, Bordaifacum is more than six times stronger compared to Difenacum and more than four times stronger compared to Bromodialon. On the other hand, we have similar potency also for non-target organisms. Ratimor Bodaifacum products are in the form of ready-to-use baits that are available in two different formulation types, as a fresh bait and as a wax blocks. Both products contain 29 ppm of active ingredient. This is so-called new low-dose commercial rodenticide. But even though the concentration of active ingredient is reduced, the product have still single feed mode of action against rats. Some pest control operators express their concern or doubts that the product with the reduced concentration of active ingredient will not be effective anymore. To dispel this doubt, there are data presented on the graph below that shows the quantity of bait needed to achieve little dose for rat and for mouse for bromodialon 50 ppm products with red bar, bordifacum 29 ppm product with blue bar, and bordifacum 50 ppm product in gray bar. And as it can be seen, the efficacy of bordifacum 29 ppm is despite the reduced concentration of active ingredient in the product, much better than of products with bromodialon 50 ppm. So therefore, there should be no worries that the products under Ratimor Bordaifacum brand would not be effective. As mentioned, we have two different formulations under Ratimor Bordaifacum brand. First one, which we'll take a closer look at, is fresh bait. Ratimor Bordaifacum fresh bait is in a paste form and is one of the most desired formulation. Formulation is based on a mixture of flour, which is mixed with solid fats and oils. The combination makes it very juicy and palatable. Since the fresh bait has a high energy rich value, which is by the way two times higher than chocolate, and it has long lasting freshness, the fresh bait is very attractive and desired for rodents. 
This formulation is very effective in, even in places where rodents have plenty of other food available. The reason for this are following. The formulation consists of combination of various high quality raw materials ensuring excellent quality of the product. There is added unique synthetic long lasting peanut butter aroma to attract rodents to the bait and the combination of carbohydrates and flavors ensures, ensures high nutritional value of the bait and this helps us to make sure that the rodents will come back to the point where the bait is placed. Ratimur Bardaifa on fresh bait is available in two different primary packaging. The first option is that the bait is packed in sachets where 10, 15 or 20 grams of fresh bait is packed in porous paper bag. This paper bag permits the flavors and minimally permits fats and thereby ensures the bait maximum attractiveness. The, the second option is blister packaging. The blister packaging or plastic tray packaging is very easy to use and is very user friendly. In no case the user come in direct contact with the bait neither when placing or removing the bait. The packaging is perfect for establishing feeding points in secure areas. Also placing of the bait is very simple for user. You just need to remove the upper sticker from the tray and it is ready to be placed in rodent box or in any other spot that is secured from access by any non-target organism. In order to show that Ratimur baits are very high palatable and effective, regular field trials are performed each Year. This field trial for Ratimur Bratafa on fresh bait was carried out by Institute of Pesticide and Environmental Protection from Republic of Serbia. The presented trial was performed in pig farm where relative attractiveness of Ratimur Bratafa on fresh bait compared to other bait was evaluated. The trial was performed using five different baits. Results of the trial are shown on this graph where the share of consumed bait for each sample is presented. We can see that the share of consumed Ratimur Bordafa on fresh bait is the highest among all tested samples. Among all consumed bait during the trial, the share of Ratimur Bordafa on fresh bait was 50%, which is more than 2.5 times higher consumption than consumption of the sample on the second place. This shows that Ratimur fresh bait does a great job on a field. The second trial was performed by, by one of our clients from South America. The baits were placed in chicken farm and the event that happened during the night were filmed. We can see how rats are coming out one by one and just in a few minutes there are a lot of them. This confirms that rats have very strong social hierarchy in place where specimens lower on the scale are first checking the terrain before other specimens positioned higher on the scale appears. Here we can see the ratimur bait which is secured on a string and rats are coming to feed on it. Even though that there is enough of other food and also chicken feet available on location, rats are preferring Ratimor fresh bait. Vex block formulation is second formulation that is available under Ratimor Bordaifa brand. Ratimor Bordaifa convex blocks are designed in a shape with a lot of sharp edges, which is very attractive for rodents, because edges allow them to start gnawing the food. Beside that, Rodents have teeth that grow constantly and they need to brush them, for which the edges on the blocks are very suitable. Excellent palatability of the blocks is achieved with a mixture of food grade ingredients, added aroma with unique vanilla smell, the use of high quality edible wax, which is added just in the right amount and due to the high level of proteins in the product. All our formulations contain bitter agents for preventing human and non-target species from consuming the bait. Vex block formulation is suitable for indoor and due to the, its moist proof quality also for outdoor use. There is also added preservative in the product which prevents mold growth and protect the bait from bacteria and fungi. Combination of paraffin wax and preservative provides us excellent performance in all environmental conditions and make the product suitable to use in damp places such as sewage systems or in other places with high humidity and temperature. The blocks are produced with the hole through the center of the block. This allows us to secure the blocks and prevent rodents from translocating the blocks from baiting point to sensitive areas. Also for the wax block formulation, the field trials to grade the relative attractiveness was performed. In this case, the conductor of the trial was National Laboratory for Health, Environment and Food Department from Slovenia. 
they performed the trial on two locations. The first location was biogas plant and the second one the pig breeding farm. All products used in the trial contained active ingredient bromodialon with concentration of 50 ppm. Each location was first checked for rodent population with preliminary checkups and placement of monitoring baits. The trial was performed using two choice method, which means that at each placing spot two different rodenticide products were placed. Baits were set up in rodent boxes and were checked, weighed and photographed regularly at each inspection. Results of the trial on biogas plants are shown on this graph, where the share of consumed bait for each sample is presented. We can see that the share of consumed ratim or wax blocks, which is marked with number one, is the highest among all tested samples. Consumption of ratim or wax blocks was almost two times higher than consumption of the sample on the second place. We got even bigger difference between samples in the second facility, which was pig breeding farm. The same as on the previous slide, the graph shows the share of consumed bait for each sample. The share of consumed ratimor wax blocks was in this case more than 64%, which is four times higher than consumption of sample on the second place, following ratimor with only a bit more than 50% consumption. On this slide, I just want you to show some pictures that were made during the trial. As seen on the first picture, there is a dead rat, which confirms not just good palatability of ratimor blocks, but also good efficacy. Second and third picture shows consumption of ratimor blocks compared to competitive products. We can see better consumption of ratimor blocks, which are on second picture positioned on the right side of the box, and on third picture on the left side of the box, where also the whole block was eaten. So, to conclude, in order to perform a good deratization, some critical success factors need to be taken into account. First, you have to use a good quality product. You need to understand the way the product works and that's why you need to read instructions on the label. At each placing spot, a sufficient quantity of the bait needs to be placed and you have to inspect the baits as often as possible. At each inspection, it is necessary to collect dead rodents and collect all unused bait. It is also very important to find and eliminate water and food sources. In case you cannot eliminate water source, then place the bait nearby. In this case, rodents will have food and water available and they will not have the need to search it on other locations. And for the end, the last very important thing is to know that no formulation or active ingredient is universal and selecting the right product for specific situation reduces the risk for environment and saves us money and time due to the effective treatments. Thank you, Marco, for the for the presentation. It's very helpful and, uh, and very useful there. I've seen um, someone has posed a question in the Q&A, so we'll tackle that at the allotted uh, Q&A time at about 10.50. Um, so what I'll do now, I'll start my, my presentation. It's quite nice because it follows on well from what Marco talked about. Um, there's a good focus there on, on Bradyphacum. So what I'll do, I'll cover some details of rodenticide resistance to some of the other active ingredients. That helps us to understand situations where we might rely a little more on the single feed anticoagulants. Um, but also bearing in mind um, the LD50s of these things and thinking of non-target species I have a section of my presentation about a particular bait station that really reduces the risk of non-target species being able to enter that bait station. Um, so we'll hear about that and that'll complement nicely with, uh, with Marco's information. My name is Dr. Matthew Davis. I am the head of technical department at Kildram Chemicals. My presentation today will be about the, the hybrid resistance reports relating to rats and anticoagulants. And it works well because I'll finish off with a discussion about non-target species and the impacts that anticoagulant rodenticides are, are having on them. And yet we'll have a, an enjoyable time, I'm, I'm sure. So the first topic then is the hybrid resistance. 
Now, the hybrid resistance finding uh, that came out in, in October, and it's all about anticoagulant resistance in rats. Um, it has been found in mice, but that's a discussion for a, for a different day, another time, another presentation. So we'll focus on the, the main finding at the moment, which is all about the occurrence in, in rats, the Norway rats, Ratus norvegicus. Now, the report that came out, that was a, a rodenticide resistance action group study, RAG, and commissioned by CRU. That was reported in October 2020. So CRU, the campaign for responsible rodenticide use. And kind of big news, really, the press release hit, and there was a lot of interest in this. I think what we need to consider is what does hybrid resistance mean in terms of control? What do we need to do if we think we have rats in our area of work that are hybrid resistant? And we'll certainly cover that with this uh, discussion. And this survey was from the period 2019 to 2020. It's been put out, it's been published. One key finding is that nearly three quarters of rats in the study were found to carry a resistance gene. This isn't the hybrid resistance fact yet. It's just an overall point that nearly three quarters of the rats in this study were carrying some form of, of resistance to anticoagulants. In the main, it's the first generation anticoagulants where we have resistance, so warfarin and cumatetralol, but some hot spots where diphenacum and bromodialone are largely ineffective. This is the new finding that one in five of the rats that were sampled in this study, so 20% we'll call it, they had not one resistance gene, but two. That's the key difference. This is what we call the hybrid resistance, the possession of two different resistance genes. And OK, I'm putting this across as it's completely brand new. It was recorded in 2017. However, an isolated incident, one case in Scotland and nothing since then. But the 2019, 2020 data shows different. This hybrid resistance is a bit more widespread than we thought and certainly of, of interest and something that we need to, to consider. So what is hybrid resistance? As previously mentioned, it's where the rat has got two different resistance genes, not the fact that I've underlined the, the important point there, two different genes. And how does this happen? Well, what we've got, we've got resistance foci, these areas of the country where there are rats carrying genetic material, it means they are resistant to some types of anticoagulants. And now being close together, different foci, different populations, that are once separate have now been able to mingle, to interact, to breed. There's been some interbreeding, and of course, the exchange of that genetic material has occurred. And that's why we're now seeing these findings of, of hybrid resistance in, in a few pockets around, around the country, it has to be said. Three types, three different types of hybrid resistance were found in the, in the report. Four do exist, like we said. There was a case in 2017 that was reported, but now the interest is developed because of the more widespread occurrences that we're finding. And yeah, to quote directly from the, uh, the press release uh, from CRU and the Redenticide Resistance Action Group, and directly from the report, a surprising and troubling increase over the period of just one year. So when the resistance experts are using terminology like that, we do need to sit up and take notice of what's out there. Um, so many reasons to take resistance management seriously. We need to get the job done effectively in terms of doing good pest control and protect and preserve public health and animal health. Also, we need to avoid using ineffective anticoagulants because we could have a, a negative impact on, on wildlife. We, we need to get things done quickly uh, for many reasons. Protect wildlife, minimise residues, while also getting a good job done in terms of protecting public health with, uh, with rodent control. So many, many reasons to take resistance seriously. Big question though, um, many of you watching this presentation will think, is it relevant to me? What part of the country are we finding these uh, hybrid resistance rats? Uh, well, we've got a nice map here, so we'll, we'll go through that. It is available from the RAG report, where you probably want to zoom in a bit more at your own leisure with the PDF and just check 
your area of the country for, for resistance data. And you can get it from the Think Wildlife website, so the crew website, thinkwildlife.org. And you can navigate there through to the, the download section where you'll find this latest resistance report. So let's have a look at the map. The two most severe mutations together as a hybrid are in three areas Greater Manchester, Dorset, and East Sussex. So L120Q is the mutation that stands out. This confers resistance in Norway rats to Bromodialone and Diphenicum. It's the Hampshire Berkshire resistance that's been traditionally referred to as that. So problematic. Um, this has cropped up with a secondary mutation alongside it, hence the hybrid terminology in these three areas. So let's, let's circle those on the map. Uh, we're using the colour brown just to follow the conventions of the original report. So there we are. Greater Manchester on the map. And then Dorset, followed by an occurrence in East Sussex. There is a second type of hybrid uh, resistance found in this in this study. That's also in Greater Manchester, um, East Yorkshire and West Yorkshire, so not a million miles uh, from here. And then finally in, in County Durham as well. This second type of hybrid resistance, uh, one of the mutations involved does confer some resistance to diphenicum and bromodialone. It raises questions about the effectiveness of those two active ingredients against Norway rat populations. So let's have a look at those on the map again. We'll just highlight in the same colour. We'll use that sort of light blue turquoise colour to match the original report. And there that appears. Greater Manchester again. Finding in East Yorkshire. Further report in West Yorkshire, and then we'll head north for County Durham. And then the third type of hybrid resistance, not as of, of concern uh, to the same degree as the previously described ones. We've got this type following the purple uh, measure, the purple marker in Merseyside. There we are. So, okay, it's not throughout the entire country. There are the highlighted areas there. If it's not in your part of the country, we shouldn't sit on our laurels and think, well, we're going to be okay. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean we've got susceptible rats. Um, could be elsewhere. We need to take care. Any potential resistance problems that we highlight, consult the RAG reports, the guidance documents, and follow those and implement resistance management should you have, have concerns. And here's the crucial thing. We've set the background. We've got information about hybrid resistance, what it is, what caused it, where it is to be found, but importantly, we need to know how to deal with it. And the key question would be, which rodenticides are most effective? Which of the anticoagulants should we be using in areas of resistance? And I point everybody to the RAG uh, guidance on this. Available on the internet, and there's a really, really useful ready reckoner table uh, within this document, uh, we follow the geographic advice there, we follow the listed mutations, and it's almost like a traffic light system, isn't it? Green, effective, red, ineffective, so stop and don't use those active ingredients in those areas where we have those types of resistance, and then amber or orange, um, question marks, proceed with caution, ideally select an alternative uh, ingredient to be sure that we've got the right level of efficacy there. I'm going to quote directly from the, the most recent report on the hybrid resistance issue, just to be clear about this. It's interesting, of course, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the problems with hybrid resistance will be any worse than what we're already dealing with, but it certainly raises awareness and keeps us focused on the matter of um, resistance management. So here's the direct quote. It seems unlikely that any of the hybrid resistant individuals that are heterozygous for two mutations, such as all those reported here, would be more resistant to anticoagulants in practice than an individual that is homozygous for the most severe L120Q 
mutation, although this cannot be declared with certainty. So I think that's good advice. Um, we're not going to get into the, the detailed aspects of resistance there, so you know maybe, maybe don't worry if um, heterozygous and homozygous doesn't mean too much to you. The main important point here is that we don't expect things to be any worse than the current situations. However, it refocuses us on the guidance table there. So let's just have a look, for example, at L120Q cropping up in the typical Hampshire, Berkshire region. And looking down here, commonly used rodenticide, diphenacum and bromodialone, ineffective against Norway rats carrying that mutation. Now, uh, hybrid resistant individuals recorded Greater Manchester, you know, thinking of someone around the corner from me. And, you know, now in that area, we've got that cropping up. So there were question marks about the effectiveness of the commonly used rodenticide. So sit up and take take note of that and go back to that map and have a good look for your, your area. So very important advice, follow the RAG guidance. We can actually all contribute to these studies. If you think you've got resistance in your area, then make use of the APHA system, the service now under the Think Wildlife umbrella uh, as part of CREW. Um, we, can, we can help to populate these maps, populate the guidance notes with information about the uh, resistance foresight that are out there, the types of resistance. Get the tail tips sent in. It's a free resistance screening service. Um, go on the Think Wildlife website, find this poster, download it, follow the information there, because what, we, what we'll get is the information put on a map. We can refer to that. We can look at our area of the country. We're forearmed and forewarned with information about which anticoagulant active ingredients will be most effective in our area. We'll get that information, send the tail tips in. Please make use of it. It's going to be very useful for everybody in the entire industry. Just to expand on that information about resistance that we've just seen, the Rodenticide Resistance Action Group, or RAG to give the acronym, They've updated their resistance guidance, and that was published in January 2021, so early this year. Uh, that's available via the RAG mini website that's on the, on the main BPCA website. So have a look at that, download those new resistance update documents, uh, and follow those because they're, they're very useful um, for all rodenticides. And cholecalciferol is one of the main reasons why these guides were, were updated, as well as knowledge of um, new findings regarding rodenticide resistance in the in the UK. So a really important update. Just looking towards the back of that document, I've taken a, a screen grab here of the appendix. It's a really handy sort of ready reckoner table covering the modes of action of rodenticides and how they fit into resistance management. And just going through some of the explanatory text at the beginning here, the recommendation from RAG is to use only effective active substances where we have resistant populations of house mice and Norway rats. Uh, the, the, the clear benefits there are that we can control quickly and efficiently rodent infestations. That in turn will limit the, uh, the spread of uh, resistance and its severity. So that's all, all good news. And it can help to reduce unnecessary and often high emissions to the environment of rodenticide active substances. Uh, we avoid that because we don't want to use ineffective substances and have them emitted into the, the environment. A difficult choice, of course, when we're selecting rodenticides, we've got to balance resistance guidance with an environmental risk assessment and also cost assessments, you know, various assessments to think about. Not always a, a straightforward choice, but certainly when we think about resistance alone, then there are some clear recommendations here. Um, yep, there's guidance on the Anticoagulants, the first generation, warfarin and kumatetralal, uh, use these against Norway rats where there is no known resistance to them. There are resistance maps on the RRAC website, and we can follow those and find out about the distribution of resistance in the in the UK. Um, looking down at the second generation rodenticides, we've got bromodialone and diphenacum here. So for use against Norway rats where there's no resistance to anticoagulants and against rats carrying L128Q mutations and Y139S mutations. If that doesn't make a huge amount of sense to you, then 
looking at the wider RAG document, there's a ready reckoner table for parts of the country, counties where things work and where, where they don't. So we can we can sort of simplify it a bit by looking at that colour coded. Red for, for stop, amber for proceed with caution, and green for green for go. So uh, dig that dig that out at your own leisure. Looking at Bradyphacum, diphathylone and Flacumafen then. Uh, we've got similar guidance, can be used against house mice and all strains of resistant rats because the, these are resistance breaking compounds. Calciferol, of course, crops up, uh, recommended against house mice and all strains of rats. And then we've got the coverage of alpha chlorolose and the, the, the gases. And actually thinking about resistance can help us consider how best to protect non-target species. I'm just going to give an explanation of that. I'm borrowing from um, a paper that's been, been published relatively recently. I'll show the citation at the end for people that want to, to read that for themselves. And the resistance guidance is, is quite clear, really. Use effective active ingredients to manage resistance. And the particular paper that I've been looking at, there's a good, a good case study there dealing with rodent populations on a particular farm on that infestation to try and control Norway rats on the farm resistant to Broward Island and Diphenicum. Over an eight month period, 830 kilos of Broward Island were, were applied uh, without much effect at all. So there is that quite large emission of anticoagulant to the environment in that particular scenario. And that was it. There was no measurable reduction in the size of the infestation due to the resistance status of the, the population there. And here's another interesting fact. One particular rat, it was found that had survived consumption of at least 450 grams of bromodialone. That's a huge amount of bait that it had survived. And that you know, arguably is is then available to, to non-target species, to predators, because that rat is is around foraging active and, and carrying bromodialone residues. And that's it. From, from the paper, to sort of paraphrase one of the important pieces that was in there, such massive environmental emissions of a second generation anticoagulant rodenticide may go some way to explaining bromodialone and diphenicum residues in wildlife. So it could be in some parts of the world where particular types of resistance are present in rat populations, that continued use of ineffective compounds leaves them available to, to wildlife. So by selecting resistance breaking compounds, we could hopefully have a, a more positive effect on, on wider wildlife and reduce the amount of anticoagulant that's out there. And that's a solid recommendation using the more potent resistance breaking compounds um, is the way to go in terms of resistance management. And there's uh, some light reading for anybody that wants to delve into these things in a bit more, more detail. Well, here it is. I think it's time for the, the big reveal. We've, we've hinted at that there might be something that you can use to limit the access by non-target species to rodenticides. And the, the title of the presentation was quite big at the beginning on protecting non-target species. So let's have a look at the uh, new development that we've got from Killgerm Chemicals. Uh, we, we've got to say thank you to Ian Urquhart of Advanced Pest Management. He's the real inventor here. And um, some development from, from Killgerm and some assistance from an independent test laboratory, but hats off to Ian for this fantastic idea. You can tell it's come from somebody with a, a lot of practical experience in the industry. So we, we saw it on the opening slide, but here it is, uh, more of a close-up view. So it's a, a rat-specific bait station. And many years in, in development, we have had this tested, an independent testing facility, a rodent facility. In the initial stages, the key thing was to determine, can rats access the tubes that protrude downwards from the bait station? And does that at the same time prevent house mice from being able to access the bait station? Now, house mice aren't the main concern. We want to stop wood mice and bank voles from getting in. So that's where, once the house mouse question was answered, we're pretty close then to answering the questions about wood mice and bank voles, and then roll it out into field trials where we have wood mice active 
and bank valves active. And of course, with the right tube diameter, the right tube length, the fact that the bait station is elevated above the ground, then that field work undertaken by highly experienced pest controllers, the confirmation there, wood mice and bank voles in those trials were not capable of entering the, the bait station. Um, and of course, rats in the field were able to enter and consume baits as, uh, as we would expect. So a very positive finding indeed. Uh, a nice little bonus, the fact that no slug or snail entry was observed. And um, we saw in the previous video how, how important that can be. So very happy to be able to, to report that. So having a look at the, the bait station itself, a bit different to the drawing, we've got a more realistic view of it fixed in place, secured in place, raised off the ground to prevent that access by non-target species. In the bottom left there, we're highlighting again, wood mice as a non-target species that we don't want to enter this bait station and consume it side. And the same with bank voles, we don't want these small non-target mammals contaminating birds of prey with rodenticide residues, anticoagulant rodenticide residues. So hopefully a big step forward in terms of meeting stewardship aims, in terms of doing a really good environmental risk assessment. I think um, if I was to do an environmental risk assessment tomorrow and I had this bait station to hand, I, I, I would use it. I mean, you know, what better way to prevent access by non-target species? So very positive stuff. Uh, and again, on the right-hand side, just that reminder, slugs and snails unable to enter, We've seen the contamination pathways that they're involved with. So again, attempting to minimise that, reduce the risk, but still get the job done. That's the be all and end all. Um, effective rodent control is what we all aim for at the end of the day. Just a little um, few images there. On the left hand side, we've got the rats entering through one of the tubes. And what we've seen in the field trials is that rats would like to enter one tube and then leave through the other. So a bit of a quirk of their behaviour, but the fact there are two tubes seems to have been quite helpful in the observations that we've we've made. Um, of course, not just focusing on rodenticide use, you can see the top image there, snap traps in place, either side of the entrance slash exit points, we're able to secure blocks in place, as well as put loose bait within, within trays. So it takes all the usual bait formulations that you'd expect, and we're still being cautious, following label directions. The ability to secure baits in place is positive, and the ability to house traps means that we're thinking about the, the risk hierarchy. Do we even need to use rodenticides in the first place? Well, we're, we're trapping here, and we're trapping for rats because of the difficulty, the inability of other species to, to enter as far as we've seen so far. A few snippets from the, the trials that were undertaken at the independent test facility, that was wild mice and behaviourally altered mice. And when I say mice here, I mean house mice. They were unable to enter. The rats were able to enter and they did so within minutes to an hour when the bait station was set at the correct height. So that moved on the studies. Knowing that house mice can't get in gives us some confidence to proceed with field trials. And with the field work, taking this out to places like farms where there's confirmed Norway rat activity, wood mouse activity, bank voles, American mink and shrew activity, then we know we've got non-target species in the area and it's a, it's a job worth doing. And we, we, we can add to the evidence, therefore, that these things aren't able to, to enter the bait stations. The evidence, of course, well, not just visual inspection for droppings of the field signs, the fact that remote cameras were installed at key locations externally to the bait station, internally, no evidence of non-target species being able to access by these different measures. Rats, of course, were entering and consuming the non-toxic bait that was in place. Um, of course, you know, in the early stages, use of non-toxic bait is the sensible way to do it. If toxic bait is in place and things don't go to plan and the non-targets are able to access it, then that's not a responsible way to conduct a trial. Um, that was it. No bait consumption, no signs of activity within the bait station, no footage caught or on camera of any non-target species in there. So very positive results. Rolling out that field work to further sites uh, with Norway rats present, wood mice, stoats at one of the sites, ground feeding birds present as well, trying to make sure it's been trialled at a number of locations with various different target species. 
uh, and some of the sites in place at the same time there of course were some standard bait stations not the species specific one but standard bait stations alongside used for over three weeks daily checks very regular checks undertaken only rats were entering the species specific stations and those interactions were, were fast they were getting in there within 24 hours uh, and no non-target species activity reported with the standard tamper resistant bait stations yes we were finding wood mouse activity including rats and also slug activity which is what we would expect that's the problem that we're trying to go some way towards solving we think we're getting there with um with further field work also the question to answer was are we able to put traps in place are rats able to access those traps is that still a worthwhile measure we're not just focusing on redensified use and the answer was was yes um, rodent monitor traps in the specific and standard bait stations were put in place at the field trials same non-toxic attractant used in both and rats were being captured by both types of bait station the standard tamper resistant bait station and the species specific so no real difference there in terms of numbers caught and that was it um, only rats caught in the specific station trapping process over several days no problems reported there still in the standard tamper resistant stations we've got that slug and snail activity um, including including wood mice as well so just to show some footage from one of the sites, um, some bank vol activity, and here it is. And here we are, a rat able to enter one of the bait stations during the testing phase. Quite able to climb up and access the bait station. Yep, recognise the camera. Hello. And just find the uh, non-toxic bait there. Just to make sure everybody knows about the, the setting of this, um, obviously full instructions uh, can be made available, but the, the key thing is to set it at the right height above the ground. And the, the major measurements there need to be set between 90 to 100 millimetres from the base of the entrance tube to the ground so elevated off the ground at that distance it allows rat entry but stops uh, prohibits entry by bank voles and wood mice just a few summary points um, from what we've seen so far we, we believe there's enough evidence to say that this uh, station reduces the risk of non-target species being able able to enter it we have no reports no observations of that whatsoever uh, and we believe that when used correctly, then the use of rodenticides can be undertaken with lower risk in, in suitable areas for this bait station. And if we're trapping and we want to avoid trapping certain species, then we believe as well there's enough evidence to say that the risk of, of trapping the, an incorrect species is, is certainly reduced. Um, slug and snail damage to rodenticides, none of that was, was reported. So we believe that there is evidence showing enough that we can talk about the reduced risk of slug and snail damage to, to rodenticides. A few conclusion points though. Um, just be a bit cautious with, with thinking about things. Um, don't forget about the basics. We believe there are lots of positives to using a species specific bait station. But what the use of this station does not mean is that an environmental risk assessment isn't needed or that careful selection of rodenticides, we're thinking the risk hierarchy, is not required, we still have to remember that target species, Norway rats, are still taken by birds of prey, such as red kites. So we still have a duty to make a good choice regarding rodenticides and make a strong environmental risk assessment. What the use of the bait station we think does mean is that we can improve our level of best practice and help ourselves deliver responsible and effective use of rodenticides while at the same time doing our absolute best to minimise impacts on non-target species. So, thank you very much. It's goodbye from him and goodbye from me.
Okay, I was about to uh, congratulate myself on my own presentation there. That would be a, <laughs> an interesting thing to do. Um, but yeah, some uh, some interesting things on the presentation there. I'm quite a fan of the uh, the debate station, um, trying to sort of improve standards and, and look at stewardship and protect wildlife while successfully using rodenticide. So a happy a happy medium, really. I think on the, the agenda now, we look to the Q&A session. So it's about 10.50. I'll have a look at uh, what we've got on the, the Q&A session and um, just see some of those. So here we go. Ah, yes, I think somebody has spotted um, or their question has been inspired by part of the branding for the, the Rattimore rodenticides. Um, I think the fresh bait has, has stuck in someone's mind there. So the, the question is, is this one. Um, how often should baits in bait stations be replaced if they still appear fresh? And I think that's a good good question, really. Maybe um, Marco might be the best place to talk about that. I think it's almost like um, we know things about shelf life in the packet. Yeah. I think this is more of a shelf life in, in the field. Yeah, uh, yeah. exactly. If the, if the bait is still fresh, then we suggest to, to change your baits in a period of four to five weeks. But if there's a dirt, if there's a mold, if there's a dust on the bait, it's better to change it because uh, otherwise it's the same as you don't have any bait on the basic spot. So if the bait is fresh, four to five weeks, it's, uh, let's say, suggestion uh, period to change the bait. I think that's good. I think we like advice like that where we have good guidance, the sort of typical average time frame, but then on a case by case, job by job basis as well. And like you said, some of the harsher environments might trigger that change over a bit more frequently than, than normal. Um, yeah, so thanks, Marco. That's that's good, good advice. Um, I just scribbled down some of the questions as well. Um, we've had, in fact, this might be more one for, for Richard, perhaps. Um, it's a bit of a product related question. Um, one of the, the delegates has seen the the bait station that I showed and of course it's fixed <laughs> to the wall, but they've asked about the ability to use that away from a wall. And have you got any advice on that, Richard? We might have something that would help them with that. Uh, yes, I have. Yeah, we recently launched a stand um, for the Amicus uh, box. So it's a galvanized metal stand with a welded plate on the base. Um, so it's preset to the correct height for the for the for the, 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 the tubes to be above the ground. And the, the, the base can either be screwed to the ground if it's hard ground like concrete or it also comes with some pins that you can pin it into the ground um, if it's soft, like on turf, for example. So, um, yeah, it, 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 you, you can use it away from a wall. Can I just also mention that um, when Matt talked about how critical the, 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 the measurements are, the height, um, the boxes do come with a template. So even if you're using them and fixing them to a wall or a fence, for example, there is a template that comes with a box that you can just put on the ground um, to ensure that you can easily make sure you draw the holes at the right height. Hope that helps. That's great, Richard. Really, really grateful for that. I think, yeah, the template is, is crucial and then the, uh, the pre-fitted height for the stand as well um, sort of reduces the chance for operator error and we get the, the effects that we need with that one. So that's good. Um, so I had a question about, um, about vitamin, vitamin K1. It seems that one of the viewers has got a, a problem site. Um, I think it must be with, with rats and there's some pet food there with, with higher levels of the vitamin K1 and, and how that may or may not affect control. I've got some of my own information on that myself, but I'm interested to hear Marco's opinion, I think, on that one. Um, it's not, it's not uh, likely, at least not at a practical scale, because there's not enough uh, doses of vitamin K in the processed food. Uh, so this should not have any impact on the baiting program we have. That's right. That's my kind of information as well. So good to good to hear that from Marco as well. I think, um, uh, you know, there, there, there's even a certain amount of vitamin K1, the antidote to anticoagulants, even in even in whole wheat. And, um, you know, rats will naturally eat some of the, the green vegetables and they have reasonably high levels of vitamin K1. Um, but in those natural food sources and even some of the animal feeds, we're not seeing a practical impact negatively on, uh, on control. Um, and I think sometimes as well, the question was good because the person writing said vitamin K1. In some of the animal feeds, it's a different type of vitamin K that's elevated, vitamin K3, which doesn't have the same impact anyway. So it's almost like a little myth-busting type, type question, really. So nice to, nice to have those and set the, the record straight. So I'll just double-check again and see uh, 
a few other things they've got they've got on there. Oh right, yeah, I've got a question um, about the uh, the amount of rodenticide in grams that you can put into the into the new bait station. Um, so basically, the, the, the newer bait station that restricts the entry by non-target species that can hold the required amount of rodenticide bait that is detailed on the product label. I know that sounds like um, a politician's answer, but that's the way it's been designed. So you know, it can hold the equivalent amount of bait as per the label directions for each rodenticide. Therefore, it corresponds to a, tradi a traditional tamper-resistant bait station. Um, so that wouldn't pose any any problems there. Um, and another one, yeah, the um, the question about getting up the pipes and the, and rats getting a, a grip on that, they can, they can actually get up there, um, and that's part of the feature of the um, of the bait station. So that although the pipe is there, the function of that is to limit the or prohibit the non-target species wood mice, bank voles from gaining access. That that the rats can still still get up there and we've, we've confirmed that with um, laboratory trials independently, semi-field trials and also practical field trials from um, one of our uh, kill germ members of staff. So well, well studied in that way. I think we're doing okay there. We've uh, had some questions covered from uh, a few people writing in. So I'm quite happy, happy with that one. Um, I think, oh yes, I made a note of this that came through earlier on in the presentation for, for Marco. Um, I think it's about the, the fresh bait trays or, or blister packs. Um, the typical size of those is 80 grams, which is aimed for rat control, but the label refers to a lower amount of bait for mice. So I think um, you wouldn't be able to use the, the blister pack slash tray as a ready to use product in that case. Would you need to do some form of decanting, Marco? Uh, yeah. yeah. For, for that pack, you can. 60 gram of bait inside. Um, there's also option to have a plastic spatula in the box in order if you want to use the, the tray also for the mice, then in this case you have to divide divide uh, the bait on, let's say, on three equal, equal uh, parts. That's fine, that's good. That's useful to know for everybody. Um, so yeah, I think, uh, I think we're done with the Q&A. Unicam, everything for pest control.